it's one thing to try and know God, and there's a lot of energy and even money expended in the world today uh, for folks to try and know God. But it's another thing altogether to be safe and secure in the knowledge that he knows us and that that's actually a good thing. And that's something boundary pushing and, and somewhat radical that Jesus is doing in this passage. He picks up the image of a shepherd, which would have been well-worn and well-known to the people in his culture and at his time. And he uses it in many of the ways the Old Testament prophets did to liken himself to the way God knows his people and to show them that that's a connection that has some resemblance to what they see as animal husbandry taking care, shepherd taking care of their sheep. And he does that to show that this knowledge is powerful, that it forms a bond, and that it has certain implications with it. I remember growing up, and some of my earliest memories at Lewis were of hearing and seeing my grandfather look after his sheep on his croft. And it always made passages like this come to life for me a bit more because I was able to visualize what it is for someone who knows their sheep really well and they have a particular call, a particular tone of voice and the sheep come and they respond to that and they have that connection and relationship of trust. And it is a beautiful picture of the trust and the protection and care that we're able to enjoy from God. But that's it positively, but negatively, Jesus is actually perhaps fairly controversially because he's here in, in dialogue with the Pharisees telling us what we should not expect from anybody claiming to represent God, be that uh, religious leaders or gurus in our world today. He's showing us that the fact that it's like a shepherd means there's a lot of things that it's not. And we're going to have a look at some of those things too. This whole parable doesn't really, it's not a parable, sorry, this uh, extended metaphor probably is better what it is in the form of a story. It doesn't really make sense unless we understand a little bit about the world that Jesus is speaking into, particularly how they organized their sheep. Sheep were for them what you and I would probably call a bank balance. It's where a lot of their livelihood is staked. It's where their wealth is. It's where their provision is. So just like you and I, if we have any money, we shove it in the bank. We then go to that to buy our food and groceries and so on. Sheep act like that. Most people in a small township in um, the ancient Middle East would have had a few sheep and that would have been some form of subsistence for them. And what they quite often did in a small township was they would have um, a kind of gate on a courtyard where they would sleep overnight. And then there would be a hired worker, usually a young boy, perhaps from one of the town's families. And he would come and he would call them out to take them out for grazing in the morning. But if you were in charge of those sheep and you were at the courtyard at the gate, you would only let them go if you knew that it was the right person that was going to take them out. Because at the end of the day, this is your stock and your livelihood. And then similarly, when there were shepherds who were doing it, if you like, a bit more full time, they... That's from verses 1 to 6. We have that sort of picture in mind. The other picture in mind is a much more remote and rural, rural stone enclosure that would be built to pen sheep in and keep them safe while they're grazing on the hills of Judea at night. And that would have to involve so much more care and protection because you're in amongst wild animals and so on. So that's kind of the pictures that Jesus draws on and uses in order to get his point across. Now, I want to look at three different aspects of the way he tells the story in opposition to the Pharisees. I want to look at firstly the fact that Jesus relates to his people as the shepherd. And then secondly, that he replaces bad shepherds. And then thirdly, that he re retrieves his sheep from far and wide. And so we'll look at firstly, how he relates to his people. Very truly, I tell you Pharisees, anyone who doesn't enter the sheepfold by the gate, but climbs in another way is a thief and a robber. And then he says, I am that gate for the sheep. Whoever enters through me will be saved. I'm the good shepherd. 
the good shepherd is not the hired hand. I know my sheep and my sheep know me. Now, on the face of it, that seems really obvious. But when Jesus talks about knowing folks, he likens it to the way he knows his father. They're in this intimate and eternal relationship of bond and covenant and community. And he's saying, now I know the people that God has given me the way God knows me. I'm extending that relationship to them. But it's not just knowledge. I have some knowledge of the Bible. You have all done different jobs in your lifetime, and that's given you some knowledge about whatever area uh, of, or sphere that you've worked in. But this is a knowledge that implies care, because look at his language. He's always saying that through his knowledge, I have the responsibility, but also the burden of care for them. The shepherds are really deliberate picture and metaphor that he gives. So he not only knows, but he knows in a way that's caring. And that's a bit more radical than you would think on first glance, because sheep are chosen because they're a fairly defenseless type of creature. Uh, There's not much that they can do for themselves in terms of feeding and grazing and uh, moving around in different parts. They're they're very vulnerable to the elements and to attacks from other predators. And they they really need cared for. And that's what he chooses. And I don't think that's supposed to be uh, disparaging to us. I think it's consistent with what Jesus says about our dependence on God as his people. And so he knows us and he still cares for us. He knows our deepest, darkest secrets, our foibles, the ways in which we uh, would probably exclude ourselves from perhaps the work of God and would think that if God knew me, then he wouldn't want anything to do with me. And that's just the opposite. Um, the, The sheep in the story are not some paragons of virtue or at the apex of the animal kingdom. There's really not much to celebrate about them. And yet the shepherd knows them and cares for them, and continues in that bond with them. It's really something to be fully known and to be fully loved. And that's what we actually find in the Gospels. God saying that, yes, you can try to know God and seek him, and that's all good. But what flips that on its head, and what's, I think, really quite extraordinary about the Gospels, is that it's God saying, I have come to show you that I know you, and also you're fully cared for, and loved, despite all your weaknesses, despite your what you would consider to be your worst darkness. We go through this quite a lot when we see young children, and they'll sometimes come, and mine will sometimes come, and uh, if they've got to tell you that they've done something wrong, and you can see the lip quivering, and there's trepidation. And, and they have that genuine question of, uh, you know, if I tell you what's going to happen to a relationship and to our connection. And it's, it's a powerful thing that you get to take part in when you're able to reassure them that uh, regardless of how weak they may be from one moment to the next, that it doesn't affect your love and care for them. And that's what Jesus does in relating to his people. He comes to our level speaks the language of his people, which is in a world steeped in shepherding, where that's how a lot of people make a living. And then he picks up what is one of the most helpless creatures in that world and says that just as that animal is known and loved, so you too are known and loved. And so God relates to his people. And then he replaces bad shepherds. He says that the ones who are no good, are thieves and robbers, uh, that they're strangers, and that the higher hand is not the shepherd and does not own the sheep. So when he sees the wolf coming, he abandons the sheep and runs away. Now, this is the difference between the person who their stock and their livelihood and their, if you like, their investment is all tied up in the sheep and somebody who just got a fiver for looking after them that day. And so when push comes to shove and they are personally in danger, they are going to make off and try and preserve their own life or perhaps just not even inconvenience themselves because they don't have that bond and connection. Now, this is where (laughs) we often celebrate the likes of John 10 as a lovely story about a shepherd and a sheep. Um, But but this is Jesus making some really weighty accusations. Um, 
Anybody who taught people about God was supposed to be uh, in a shepherding role in the ancient world. That was the role that God played. He always identified himself as Israel's shepherd, and he gave them other shepherds to teach them, to feed them the word of God. And we still speak of that way today. And they weren't doing it. The Pharisees are the religious leaders. And we know from Jesus' words that what they're often doing is taking the treasure and the riches of God's word and everything he's revealed to them, using it to kind of fatten themselves on that knowledge and not really breaking it down and and handing it out for people. Um, Probably the best illustration of this is in Ezekiel chapter 34, which is some 700 years before Jesus is speaking. So they'd, um, they'd been at this a long time because in some ways, the exile that happened in the Old Testament where the people of Israel were scattered was just because of this sort of approach from the religious rulers and the elites. The Lord says to Ezekiel, prophesy against the shepherds and say to them, woe to you shepherds who take care of yourselves. Should you not take care of the flock, you eat the cards, you clothe yourselves with the wool, you slaughter the choice animals, but you do not take care of the flock. You have not strengthened the weak or healed those who are injured. There's enormous responsibility placed by God on folks and that relating and that caring for and wanting to give out of oneself is paramount. And the shepherds of Israel and the Pharisees in this day are not doing that. They are using the system to benefit themselves in a way that leaves nothing for the people. And you can basically, I think, use this as a test for wherever you are, whatever uh, claiming to provide religious goods and services or spirituality or knowledge about the truth of God you you can apply this test. Those who are in a kind of leading role or who are supposed to be shepherds, what is their approach? To what degree do they benefit and profit from whatever, however the system is organized? And to what degree are, are, are the ordinary people who come to look for life and truth, are they left feeling unsatisfied or used? Nearly every cult that exists in our world today, and some of them are, you know, look fairly innocuous, like, multi-level marketing schemes, and some of them are are obviously downright dark. But what they all have in common is a pyramid leadership structure where people at the top benefit really well, and the great, all the masses, are used to just feed resources and money and um, time and their energy into that system to keep benefiting those. And Jesus is saying, if this is real, if you have heard the commission and the call of God and you have God's truth, it's the opposite. If you are then commissioned by God, you give out and give away what you have for the benefit of those under your care. And so anytime that, you know, church doesn't look at all like shepherding, then we know that we've kind of stopped to really function like a church because we're trying to pattern ourselves on the words of Jesus. And what does Jesus do? I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. Now, not only does Jesus teach and in that sense feed people's souls while he's on earth, he has compassion on them for what they're not getting from their religious leaders. He takes that to the ultimate degree in demonstration of love by not just replacing doing what the others should be doing, but then doing what no one else can do and giving up his life. If you think of the picture he gives of a hired hand who runs away when a wild animal comes, uh, Jesus stays and actually goes to the point where he gives his own life away and his own blood in order that people can know God's care forever, in order that people can know that they are purchased by God and that they belong to him and there's a security to it. And so there's no contrast at all. Jesus not only replaces the bad shepherds and what they should be doing, but he does what uh, nobody else can do in paying the ultimate price, which we celebrate at communion, that we have a God who has loved us to that degree and demonstrated once and for all, fully and finally, 
the degree of his de- and depth of his care for us. And then finally, he retrieves his sheep from far and wide. In verse 16, he says, I have other sheep that are not of this sheepfold. I must bring them also. They too will listen to my voice and there shall be one flock and one shepherd. This is the part of the gospel that is still very much happening today. Jesus is speaking to a group of people who are in some ways religious and ethnic elites. They think that um, the revelation and the provision of what God has said is for them. It's for those who are like them and it probably shouldn't go to anyone else. And Jesus's ministry is continuing to push out this good news of God having come to rule in their midst and being revealed through Jesus to more and more different kinds of people. At first, you know, Samaritans and the folks to the north who the Jews despised and then eventually to more and more Gentile territory and then through the rest of the New Testament all around the known world. And that continues to happen today. And I think we need to always be on the lookout for who are the sheep that are not yet of this fold. Because the beauty of being in a church setting is that we get to experience something like what Jesus has said here. There are some of us who've been here because we've been in church and in church settings our whole life. We've had some form of faith our whole life. There are others who that's been a gradual dawning in the last few years. And there are others who are really just starting to explore this. But none of us are excluded from the sheepfold and none of us are excluded from the elements that God gives us to build us up spiritually because he has one sheepfold, one body, one church. And we all have an equal share in it because we've all come in where? Through the gate, through Jesus himself. We all came in by believing in and trusting in his words and apprehending them for themselves, uh, for ourselves and knowing that sense of spiritual change and difference that he makes. And that gives us all something in common. And that will continue to give us something in common with the people who are not yet of the sheepfold, because I think this is still active. I think Jesus would say today in our community, in our town, and in all through our country, that there are still people who are not of this fold, but they have a place here and they belong here. And I think it's for us as a church and a people to look at the empty seats and spaces and to keep praying into God, who are the sheep that you're calling, the people you're calling from in our community who haven't yet taken their place, but they belong here. They might not look like us or sound like us. They might not have the same cultural background or interests. They might not be the sort of people who would consider themselves to be natural sheep of God. But that's true of all of us in one way or another at one time, because he still has sheep who are not of this fold. And so they have a place in hearing the God through Jesus who relates to his people. He knows who we are, where we are, where we've been, and he continues to relate to us with his love. He replaces the bad shepherds, all the snake oil salesmen, all the folks who have tried to communicate something of God and have just looked to benefit themselves. And he shows us, I'm nothing like that. And my truth is nothing like that. It should enrich you and enliven you. And you can know that because I gave my life for you. And he retrieves folks from all different walks of life that they might come and hear this good news and have their lives changed and know what it is to have Jesus as their good shepherd relating to them. May God bless his word to us this morning. Amen.